Hey guys, today we're going to be talking about drug delivery. So when people are designing new drugs for the first time, they have a lot of things that they need to consider. For example, how is it going to be absorbed into the body? Is it going to be an oral administration? Is it going to be like chemotherapy into the vein? Is it going to be able to be absorbed into the intestinal tract? We also have to think about how is it going to be distributed throughout the bloodstream? Okay, so some things that we have to consider specifically related to that are how long is it going to actually be circulating? So we can think about drugs that need to circulate for a certain amount of time. We think about this as avoiding clearance. So clearance is basically kind of a fancy word for metabolizing and processing any kind of medication. So you can see that this is going to be processed in the liver. We metabolize it. Ultimately, this is cleared, which would be excretion. Um, in this case, we're looking at something going through the kidney excreted as urine. So we have to make sure that the drugs that we have are able to stick around long enough to do the job that they need to, but not so long as to cause problems. So that's step one of the things that we need to consider. Along those same lines, we have to make sure, for multiple reasons, that these drugs are not going to trigger your immune system. First of all, this can cause inflammation and allergies. Second of all, we want to make sure that it's not going to prematurely remove the drug from the system. So while our immune system is normally just hanging around doing a great job, making sure that we're not getting infections from bacteria, if this is going to actually attack some of the medications that we're taking, this can result in this being removed from the bloodstream too early. There are ways that we can get around this. For example, pegylation is one of the ways that we can kind of modify drugs to make them sort of stealthy in the bloodstream, but we won't talk about those specifics here. Finally, the third thing that we'll be talking about today, and something that is just as important, but we'll be focusing on it a bit more, um, is actually how do we get the drugs where we need to get them? How do they know where to go in the body? How do they know to actually work on the correct cells? So when we think about drug targeting, we know that we have to actually hit the mark. So here are some germs from Dr. Mario. So if you're not familiar with that, first of all, stop what you're doing right now and go play it. The premise of this game is, of course, to make sure that the correct color pill is going to be touching the correct color bacteria. And we know that if we end up hitting the wrong target, then that results in a game over. Okay, a real life example of how this can cause negative effects is with chemotherapy or anti-cancer drugs. So when we have candidate drugs that are gonna be very selective for only the cancer cells, then we end up having no off-target, no side effects. So this is when you think about side effects from the medication, that big long list of things that are always read to you, a very calming voice with fancy emotional music that sounds really enthusiastic and happy, sort of overlaid over it on all the drug commercials. Those are the side effects, okay? So when we don't have any side effects or off-target effects for this chemotherapy drug, then we'll end up attacking only the cancer cells, leaving our normal cells to do their job. When we have chemotherapy drugs that are going to end up attacking our normal cells as well, then we can end up with side effects. So examples of this, most cancer drugs that we think about actually target rapidly dividing cells. So this can also hit cells like in our hair follicles, and that's why you see hair loss in cancer. So um, this is gonna be an example of an off-target effect that we absolutely do not want. So today we're gonna to be considering some ways that people are researching to try and figure out how do we target the cells that we need to target while also remaining stealthy, evading the immune system, and avoiding premature clearance from the bloodstream. So we'll be looking at a lot of different ways that people are exploring this um, that can range from just kind of capitalizing on biological systems that already exist, or we can look at creating our own synthetic systems. And so a lot of the things that we'll be looking at will be kind of somewhere along the spectrum. Okay, so some examples that we're going to be talking about today with biological systems, capitalizing on the way that bacteria and viruses already work to kind of do our bidding. 
Some things that we'll look at a little bit later will be kind of these more synthetic systems. There are a couple of these at the end that we'll be talking about, um, but the rest we'll be doing on a second slide set. Okay, so we'll go ahead and get started with our bacterial systems. So there'll be three basic bacterial systems that we'll be talking about today. So thinking about bacterial cell, we know, again, mostly this is just a stack of cytoplasm. You know, they can have a lot going on in terms of if they're gram-negative, gram-positive. They don't have a nucleus. That's, you know, the hallmark of being a prokaryote. But they do have kind of a nucleoid region, which will be where all of the central dogma transcription kind of pre-translation is going to happen. So the first way that we can think about getting these guys to do our bidding is by getting them to express therapeutic proteins. So on the next couple of slides, we'll be exploring what exactly we mean by therapeutic proteins. But as we get started, I'll also give you an example of a way that we're already using this. So using bacterial expression systems is actually how insulin um, for diabetic patients is currently produced. So in this case, we're not looking at something like that, but trying to actually get these little guys to both make this protein and deliver it to its target cell. So that's kind of the idea that we're gonna be thinking about. Okay, so as I promised, first we're gonna be looking at what are some therapeutic proteins, just to give you some examples. So we do have cancer treatments. Monoclonal antibodies are often used as a cancer treatment. They're also used um, more frequently these days in autoimmune disorders, um, things like that. So monoclonal antibodies, we're looking in this case at cancer cell. These are gonna be able to recognize specific attributes of the cancer cell that are gonna be a little bit different from the normal cells that surround it. And so these can help target and sort of mark these cancer cells for your own immune system to take care of it, okay? You can also use antibodies in other ways that we'll see in a minute to help target things to where they need to go. So monoclonal antibodies is one example of therapeutic proteins. Other things that we can think about are certain types of hormone therapies. So in this case, we're looking at parathyroid hormone. So here we have a nice thyroid gland, okay, parathyroid glands. Okay, and they're gonna make parathyroid hormone that they need to distribute out everywhere, okay? So if you have problems with your parathyroid glands, they're, for whatever reason, not getting the job done, you may have to supplement with parathyroid hormone. Okay, so that would be one example of a therapeutic protein. We can also look at enzyme treatments. So enzyme treatments are really common uh, treatments for things like lysosomal storage disorders, or when you have problems um, breaking down molecules that tend to build up in certain cell types. So we can look at, for example, here's just an enzyme, okay? Go around, its normal job is to just go ahead and break apart these molecules, okay? If this can't do its job, then you might get a buildup of certain types of molecules in cells, and this can often lead to cell death. Okay, so enzymes also going to be an important um, thing that we sometimes need to supplement when people have problems making them. So where do the bacteria come in? So to understand why we even need bacteria for this, we have to think about what does a protein look like relative to some of the other drugs that we can synthesize on our own? So proteins obviously very useful, but they're really complex. So what we're looking at here is a recombinant version of human coagulation factor eight, okay? And that's not the important part. It's not, the name's not the important part, but the idea is to look at the overall size of this. And we're gonna compare it to its friend ibuprofen, okay, and you can see that ibuprofen is really small relative to this particular protein, and many proteins are often around the size of our human coagulation factor eight. So ibuprofen, really easy to synthesize, okay, some of you guys may have at one point done this synthesis in an organic chemistry lab, Proteins, they take a little bit more um, 
kind of, I don't want to say work put into it, but it takes a little bit more to build these. And when we already have bacteria that can put them together for us, then that's why we tend to want to go with bacteria. Okay, so making sure that we can get them expressed and targeted where they need to go. Okay, so how do we create these molecules and make sure they end up where they need to go? How do we get bacteria to do this for us? So to understand how we get bacteria to express the proteins that we care about, the therapeutic proteins, we have to understand in general how bacteria make their proteins. So again, this is gonna tie into central dogma. Hopefully none of this is really news to you. You have a bacterial cell, okay? And obviously the nucleoid or the nucleish region is kind of what I call it. Not membrane bound, it's just gonna be the place where our bacterial DNA is going to live, more or less. Okay, so we've got our nice nucleoid region and in that region, wherever the DNA is, we're gonna have a stretch of DNA with bacterial genes. So this can be normal things that they're expressing just to keep themselves alive, okay? So we know that DNA serves as a template to produce an RNA copy through transcription. So they're making RNA, okay? And obviously this is all happening in the same space, but I'm gonna separate it for clarity. The RNA, is going to be latched onto by a ribosome, which will translate this into a protein, okay? And these triangles will say that these are just regular bacterial proteins, whatever this needs to live, okay? So if we want this to make something that we're interested in, then we have to start at the DNA level, okay? We have to tell this bacterial cell what we want done. We have to give it instructions in the form of DNA. So you can think about replacing that bacterial gene with a gene for some type of therapeutic protein that we're interested in expressing. So once we've done that, the bacteria don't really know that we've substituted this for something that it was supposed to be making or drop this down between two genes. It just sees instructions and it's just gonna do it. So we can take the RNA, okay, that we're making now, obviously gonna head back over to the ribosome and then we can translate whatever therapeutic protein that was gonna be, and that's what our bacteria will produce. Clearly in combination with what it needs to live as well, because you know if it's dead, it's a little bit difficult for it to continue to make proteins. Okay, so this expression system, again, as I mentioned, we already kind of use this in some ways for things like insulin production. In that case, normally trying to purify those proteins out of the system so that we can just basically give pure insulin or whatever drug to the patient. But we're also gonna be thinking about ways that we could utilize this so that these bacteria can target things where they need to go. So generally, these bacteria that we're using, this type of system, are going to be double, triple, quadruple checked to make sure that they're not gonna cause disease, that they're able to coexist in a person, um, make these proteins and not cause any additional problems, okay? So this would be considered kind of a non-pathogenic standard bacteria that should not cause any issues, okay? So using these to create recombinant therapeutic proteins. Another way that we can use bacteria to our advantage is to use them basically as little mules to carry stuff. So this can be nanoparticles. So you may kind of wonder, what is a nanoparticle? Probably have an idea that it's small. It's gonna be smaller than bacteria, okay? And we're gonna look at a couple of examples on the next slide. What is a nanoparticle? A particle generally between one and 100 nanometers, okay? And just for reference, on average, Bacterial cells are about one micrometer or a thousand nanometers in diameter, depending um, what their morphology is. Okay, and that's just an average value, but you can see that bacterial cells are actually quite a bit larger than these particles, so they're gonna be trafficking. Okay, so again, here's our bacterial cell. We can load it up with different things. So this is obviously a very simple diagram, but we can kind of load it up with cations for cancer therapy. We can load it up with those antibodies again to help us recognize when trouble's happening, okay? 
we can go ahead and load it up with actually gold particles. And this is again used in cancer therapy. And the idea is that if these bacterial cells can find their way to the appropriate cancer cells, then they may deliver this therapeutic cargo to the target cells. And so the idea is to use bacteria that ultimately won't cause any further disease and will be able to at least have some type of targeting ability. So when we do use these bacteria to traffic these nanoparticles, when we sort of glue these therapeutic molecules to the outside of these cells, these bacteria are still alive. They're able to do whatever they need. They have their nucleoid region that we've not modified in any way. Okay, so they're able to kind of like scoot around the human body and do whatever they need to, hopefully landing where we want them to. And these guys, we are gonna to refer to as microbots. Okay, so that's a pretty cute name um, for what these bacteria are doing, okay? And the third way that we're gonna use bacteria is really my favorite. This is, to me, a very cool thing that we can do. Um, basically, we can hollow out, sort of scoop out bacteria and create what's known as a bacterial ghost. So this is gonna literally be kind of the empty bacterial membrane that we can load up burrito style with therapeutic cargo. So how does one create a bacterial ghost? Well, I'm really glad that you asked because I created a bunch of slides to tell us, okay? So bacterial ghosts, there's several ways to kind of approach this, but one of the kind of traditional ways is to engineer these bacteria so that they'll express a bacterial lysis factor kind of on command when we want them to. So these lysis factors often cause holes in the bacterial membrane. So once we get ready, we grow up a healthy population of bacteria, once we get ready to have these guys hollowed out, we have them express whatever this lysis factor is, okay? And then we'll see that these start to create holes, and I've just put them on either end because I like the burrito-esque nature of this. Um, but these can create holes in the membrane, and pretty much the osmotic pressure causes all of the contents to sort of come out. Okay, so this is all the cytosolic contents. This is gonna be the DNA, everything that's really like important for this guy to live. It's gonna be squirted out either end until it's a dried up husk, okay? Once we get this sort of empty shell, we can then fill it with whatever therapeutic cargo that we need, okay? And these ends, because they're lipids, eventually you kind of seal them up, okay? And that's gonna create a non-living, basically empty shell of what was once bacteria, but that are filled with therapeutic cargo. Okay, this maybe is a drug of some type, maybe some type of um, nanoparticle, whatever it is we need to put in here. So we can use their little shells, kind of like a tiny little tauntaun, for our therapeutic cargo to live in, to protect it until it gets to whatever target, okay? And obviously these bacterial ghosts are not gonna have the targeting ability that they might have when they're alive. They don't, you know, they really don't have a lot going on right now, but these guys can carry therapeutic cargo. Um, these guys are also useful, this is just an aside. Sometimes in things like developing vaccines, you can put sort of like empty husks of stuff into vac vaccines now and again, just to kind of stimulate the immune system. But these guys are very much dead, not able to cause disease in any way. They do not have any genetic material, so no risk of horizontal gene transfer. So that's just kind of an aside, um, something that people kind of work with. Okay, so we've talked about three ways that we can use bacteria, right? So now it's time to pause that video. How well do you think these bacterial systems solve the big three questions that we have been looking at? Avoiding clearance, just metabolism, evading the immune system, and how well can they target? Welcome back. I hope that you have jotted down a few notes about what you thought about bacterial systems and how they're gonna approach those three big problems that we talked about. So we're gonna look at three viral systems as well, how to capitalize on what viruses do. So we should be very well aware of 
how viruses are able to infect human cells. That is 100% of the reason that I am filming this lecture and giving it to you online at present. Okay, but we can actually exploit these right back. Viruses, we know, are going to be exploiting us, but we can turn the tables on them. Okay, and that's going to take us understanding a little bit about the way that these work. Okay, so here's the general structure of our viruses. We're going to be seeing this again on future slides. And this is just one of the ways that viruses can be arranged. Uh, we'll look at a few other types of viruses, ways that they are going to have um, their shapes, um, their sort of configuration a little bit later in a different video. But today we can kind of see just a general idea of what's going on. Okay, so we can have capsid proteins. Okay, I like to start there. This is, these are going to be proteins that protect what's going to go down in our sort of area where our genetic material is. The genetic material can either be DNA or it can be RNA, depending on the virus that we're working with. And viruses can have these sort of lipid envelopes, these lipid bilayers going around the outside. Okay, and this is, this is why they tell you to wash your hands with soap, because soap helps break up these lipid bilayers. Okay, and then we're gonna have some configurations. Sometimes we have proteins on the outside, protein spikes. Sometimes we have variable stuff on the outside. But the big components that we care about are gonna be the genetic material, so the sort of chewy nougat center of the sky, um, the capsid that's gonna protect it, and that's gonna be really important later because these capsid proteins, if you put a bunch of them together, will actually self-assemble into a sort of container, okay? And then we're gonna have, again, lipid bilayer, which we'll get to in a moment as well, okay? So three ways we can use this. The first, using them kind of as is, but with a few small modifications, okay? So we can actually replace viral contents, so this genetic material, with our own special genes, okay? And to understand why that's important and how to do this, we can think about how these actually replicate in a human cell. So here's a eukaryotic cell. We can see a proper nucleus this time. Here's our genomic DNA, all chromatined out, okay, stretched out, just doing its interface business. We zoom in, okay, and then we can have our virus enter, all right? It's endocytose, some kind of thing, okay? You know, it got into the cell somehow. We zoom in on this guy, again, just to sort of clarify, what my virus has going on here, lipid envelopes. Okay, I've kind of omitted any like proteins and things on the outside for clarity. Okay, capsid proteins protecting our genetic material. And again, the important thing about these capsid proteins is that if you put them together, they can kind of self-assemble. That won't be so important right now. It will be part of how our virus works, but that property will be essential to understand how we're gonna use these a little bit later. So we can zoom back out. Once it's in the cell, the lipid envelope is gone by this point. These caps of proteins sort of dissolve, okay? They kind of come apart. And our genetic material is gonna end up, most cases, being incorporated into the actual DNA of our eukaryotic host, okay? That's why these viruses are really so terrible. This is why it's so difficult to get rid of things like HIV because those viruses actually insert their instructions into the human genome, okay? So they're gonna kind of insert improper instructions into our DNA where there's not a whole lot at present that we can do about it, okay? So once it's there, it's gonna really crank up expression of its own parts. It's gonna make more copies of its genetic material. It's gonna make a lot of these capsid proteins, any other proteins that it's gonna need, instructions for getting this lipid envelope together. All of that's gonna be kind of hijacked by the virus DNA that's now in our genome. So these components out here in the cytosol can actually sort of start to assemble, self-assembling these capsids, these lipid envelopes around it, and then off they go to cause more problems elsewhere. Okay, so that's kind of how our viruses work. 
but we actually want to capitalize on this this time to deliver therapeutic DNA or genes to areas that we may need to edit in the genome. And we'll talk about some examples of that in a minute. But first, let's see how this works. Okay, so if we really want to capitalize on this, we can think about, again, that situation where we had all these capsids that can assemble, we had our sort of genetic information. Okay, what we can actually do, is take this sort of out of the cell system right now, and kind of into a tube in the laboratory, we can replace basically the viral contents, this genome, with DNA or genes that we're interested in delivering. So some examples of this that people look at is again, trying to do preliminary experiments to sort of edit out things like HIV, to deliver genes like, for example, functional copies of the genes responsible for cystic fibrosis. Um, this is one of the early ways that people really started investigating this. In another video, uh, we may see how things like CRISPR or more modern techniques work, but for today, we're just gonna be talking about viruses. So we can replace this genetic material with what we want. So something good that we wanna to deliver to our eukaryotic cells. Reasons to use this is because when we have sort of genetic-based disorders, things like cystic fibrosis, where you have genes that are gonna malfunction, those genes are present in every cell in your body. You've got a copy of that. So just taking a pill is not gonna cut it. You have to get in the genome and be able to deliver functional copies to at least a large portion of the cells for this to work. And that's why we're using these viral systems. So we let this package back up and then we can send these off, hopefully to do something good, okay? So using kind of virus systems as is, Using their inherent sort of infective nature, their ability to cause genetic material to be inserted back into the genome, that's what we're capitalizing on here. We're just making sure that we are able to control what it is that's being inserted, okay? So other things that we can do, remembering those sort of self-assembly properties of these viral components, particularly in this case, the capsid, we can actually end up producing therapeutic cargo, just as we did for bacteria, okay? And we can have these capsid proteins expressed. So this is not a live virus, it's not complete. It doesn't have any DNA, but these are just these capsid proteins, okay? We can actually just have these assemble, okay? So we can have these assemble sort of in vitro and make this sort of like an m, &M shell, kind of a candy coating. So I don't have an animation, but I do want to compare. So with the viral vector, we're sort of using a complete virus, okay, sort of complete virus. And here, this virus-like particle, which is what we just introduced, okay, instead of having DNA, we cause these proteins to sort of self-assemble around therapeutic cargo, whatever this is gonna be, okay. The third way that we use this, again, kind of capitalizing on these properties, this time using the lipids, okay? So lipids that we can think about, these sort of have self-assembly properties too, um, just because of the way that lipids kind of act in solution. They don't like to touch water, so they would prefer to be touching other lipids. They kind of want to self-assemble and exclude water from any of these fatty acid tails. So we can actually use that, use the reconstituted virus-like lipid bilayer to produce what's called a virus cell. Okay, again, packaging that therapeutic cargo. So you can see by comparison, our viral vector uses almost the complete virus. So this is kind of like a no waste situation. We just replace the gene with something we're interested in. Our virus-like particle uses the self-assembling capsid proteins to sort of scoop up and capture therapeutic cargo. Our virusome, we're sort of looking at lipid bilayer instead. Okay, so the sort of self-assembling property of lipids to capture this, okay? So we can go back now, kind of think about the three ways that we've used these viruses, okay? So I think probably now is a good time to again, pause that video. How well do you think that these viruses solve our big three problems? Can they avoid metabolism or clearance? 
Are they going to cause any problems in the immune system? And one of our most important focuses of today, can they actually target specific cell types? Are they going to actually target where they need to go? Okay, welcome back, you guys. Hopefully, again, you've jotted down some notes. We'll be discussing those in class. Okay, so I just have a couple of more examples of artificial systems. So this will not be the full extent of all of the artificial systems that we'll be talking about in class, but I do want to kind of throw a few out there that I thought were kind of interesting, particularly because these artificial systems are capitalizing on sort of those viral properties that we looked at previously. So kind of trying to mimic the idea of viruses, okay? So this particular example um, is of something called a nanogel, and these are really, really weird and excellent. So what we have here, I like to actually start on the right, is we have a situation where in a somewhat higher pH, so this is pH 7.4, okay? So we're still within the realms of like physiological pH, but you know, certain, parts of the body can be a little bit higher pH than others, okay? So we can think about in this situation, we're going to have this sort of inner shell that's going to contain whatever type of drug that we're looking at. In this case, um, we're looking at actually an anti-cancer therapy. So this is gonna be sort of captured in here. Anytime we're at this pH, it's a little bit above neutral, we're going to be seeing that this closes up so that this is all trapped inside, BSA causing kind of like a barrier. And this is that uh, peg, like peg, like pegylation that I mentioned at the beginning of this slide set. Um, this can be used for a lot of different things. This is a really useful molecule. Um, when we talk about like medications and drugs, this is one of the things that can be used for stealth, okay? But it can be used for a lot of different things. In this case, this is going to be kind of our inner shell. Okay, and when we transition to areas of the cell that are gonna be a little bit lower pH, okay, so not too different. Again, we're still in this physiological range, okay. We can actually start to open up. So these interactions change, and we can have cations sort of come in okay, to this actual compartment. So this is ionized. I'll be showing that on the next couple of slides. This causes openings where this drug can actually diffuse out, okay? So this can kind of help keep things contained until you get to the area that you need to go. So let's look at an animation of this, okay? So here we're sitting, again, at that kind of slightly higher pH. So again, within physiological range, just a little reminder that pH, we're dealing with our protons or our hydrogen ions here. So higher pH, less of those. Okay, and when we do transition to a time where we have slightly more of these, so we're looking at a slightly lower pH, okay, we can open this up and have that drug diffuse. Okay, so these nanogels are actually very cool because you can kind of keep the drug contained until you're ready to release it. A second artificial system that I wanted to just kind of end with today are filia micelles. Okay, so if you know anything about micelles, you know that they are kind of self-assembling lipid layers, okay, for again, again for that same reason um, that we can assemble those virosomes. These lipids do not want to touch water. So when you put them kind of together, they can assemble into different shapes depending on their properties. These filia micelles are basically filament-shaped micelles, and they're kind of like a giant tube sock made out of lipids. And by giant, I mean giant in micelle terms, not in actual tube sock terms. So I like to think about this. You can fill this with any kind of cargo that you want. And I kind of think about this, if we're thinking about tube socks, it's kind of like a Christmas stocking, but instead of all the things, it's gonna be filled with therapeutic drugs. Okay, so today we have covered a few different systems. We'll be covering some more in class, but some conclusions that we can take from this is that we can actually use bacteria and viruses to do our bidding. So we talked about things like expressing recombinant proteins, therapeutic proteins from bacteria, using them as microbots to sort of traffic these nanoparticles where they need to go. And we talked about bacterial ghosts. 
for viruses, we talked about using the virus kind of as is, but replacing the genetic material with something that we're more interested in. We talked about virus-like particles, which capitalize on that self-assembly of those capsids, and virosomes, which are going to be that lipid-based virus part. Okay, so again, packaging things that we need to package. Okay, there are going to be disadvantages and advantages to each type of system. Hopefully, you kind of thought about that during the times when you were to pause the video. We'll be talking about some of these in class, but thinking about are they going to be able to stick around long enough? Are they going to be captured by the immune system? Are they going to be able to actually target where they need to go? And so where we're kind of gearing up for is recognizing which one would be most appropriate for each situation. So I'll go ahead and end the video today with our biology joke. 